Hello, everyone, and welcome. We're ready to start our webinar now. My name is Miguel Barrios, and I'm a technical services manager for poultry with EW Nutrition. Today, it's my great pleasure to introduce our presenter, Jim Donald. Jim is a professor emeritus from Auburn University, where he taught design, construction, and management of poultry houses for over 30 years. He was instrumental in founding the National Poultry Technology Center and currently serves as a technical consultant to several poultry companies and poultry trade organizations. With his background, you can imagine the level of practical, solution-oriented expertise of today's presenter. Well, good morning uh, and good morning to uh, the participants, or good afternoon, depending on where you're located. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, be part of this webinar and to talk about a topic that is uh, certainly on most of our minds with respect to broiler production. And uh, thank you, EW Nutrition, for uh, this opportunity. So back, I will turn it back to you, Miguel, to explain who the panelists are and uh, what the agenda will be today. Thank you. Uh, Professor Jim Donnell is joined today by our panelists. Please introduce yourselves. Hello, my name is Twan van Guerra. I'm a global technical manager for EW Nutrition, focused on poultry, and I'm looking very much forward to, um, to participate and hopefully uh, pr uh, provide some meaningful answers to questions that you might submit. Hello, uh, I am Ajay Boyer. I'm global technical manager for EW Nutrition uh, for poultry. I'm working out of uh, United States. Thank you very much for joining uh, today's webinar. Thanks. So together we'll help answer questions during and after the presentation. Questions can be asked throughout the webinar in the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen. Some will receive instant replies from us and some will be picked up and answered in the live discussion that will follow Jim's presentation. At the end of our webinar, we kindly ask you to answer our survey so we can improve our webinars. It'll take less than a minute. So now let's get into it. Professor Jim, you have the floor. Thank you again. Um, and uh, as you see, this will more or less be the agenda today. And uh, we hope everyone will uh, participate in the Q&A session and uh, take time to answer the brief uh, questionnaire uh, at the end of the seminar. So in all of my teaching and my exposure to poultry for more than uh, 50 years, uh, heat stress has always been a topic that would come up. And uh, uh, because of my length of time being involved with poultry, m much of what I learned about heat stress in poultry was before the advent of tunnel ventilation. Tunnel ventilation brought a new dimension to cooling birds and perhaps um, ma made, um, uh, made another uh, aspect or dimension that we have overlooked. We, we've always thought of heat stress as being strictly associated with uh, temperature, ambient air temperature, but uh, uh, that, that, that is not the case and uh, it's probably good to review. So my, my plan today is to, um, to walk us through several uh, different scenarios, look at a few videos, and we will uh, learn uh, a little bit about heat stress. Um, uh, let's see. Am I, um, am I live here? I, I, I got a, a note popped up on my screen. Miguel, just give, somebody give me an, uh, an indication. So, so what causes heat stress? And really, what is uh, the, the, the balance, the heat balance of a, of a bird? Uh, what is, a lot of people would have a, a, a little bit of a, a, a confusion in there is a difference in removing heat from a poultry house and removing heat from a bird. And uh, uh, those of us who haven't spent a lot of time studying ventilation might want to try to recognize the difference in that. 
We also need to take a look at, uh, at birds and their mass, or not necessarily their age, but their mass, and, and, uh, and take a quick look at how long does it take to cool a bird off. And, uh, um, and then uh, we, we, we would also, um, let's see here. Um, We would, we would also want to <clears throat> look at some of the things that we could do in, in an existing building to uh, minimize heat stress. Most people know that we, we don't get to design a new poultry house. We build one and it try, we try to use it for, for 30 years or more. And so sometimes our building and the equipment in the building will certainly limit us to um, to what we can do. There are times when we're in weather conditions uh, when uh, and stocking densities when when we uh, we have no choice. We just have to suffer uh, with some heat stress. So we all know as bro as broiler people, as chicken people, we know that uh, the big one of the biggest uh, one of the biggest things that affects us when we have birds that are not uh, in their comfort zone is they don't want to eat. That's a uh, a biological thing. They take themselves off feed. Therefore, and they do that because uh, the feed they eat is nothing more than a biological fuel that runs their body. So they take themselves off feed and uh, uh, that helps uh, reduce the, uh, the, the uh, calories into the body, which of course gets us into uh, a decreased growth rate and pullets. It's, it's difficult sometimes to get the weight on the birds each week. Uh, if uh, heat stress is severe, we have increased mortality. Uh, if heat stress is severe, it causes other uh, issues with the immune system. And I think some of our panelists are more qualified to talk about that uh, uh, than I am. So hopefully we'll, we'll get into that a little bit in the questions and answers. But heat stress, when we're in heat stress or we have a bird in stress, uh, uh, it is not an efficient bird. And our goal with uh, broilers, as we, we all know, is to make every calorie in that bird, uh, make every calorie in that bird um, uh, count for taking care of body maintenance and then also um, have uh, calories left over for growing and gaining. So I think it's a good idea in, in, uh, to, to review, uh, just to slightly review something about uh, how do birds get rid of heat. Uh, there's really two types of heat that uh, birds have, the two methods of getting rid of heat would probably be a better way to say in this. And the numbers I'm going to share today are just average numbers. They, these numbers would vary slightly by breed. They would, uh, they would vary. Uh, they would vary by breed, they would vary by age. Uh, so um, uh, uh, let's, let's don't get down to the decimal points. Sensible heat is given off by the body of a bird or a human or an animal. It's the heat that comes off the body that goes into the air. It's the transfer of heat convectively from the surface of the body to the surface of the air. And basically a bird needs to give off about five BTUs per pound or 11 BTUs per kilogram. We, we in the chicken business, we always have called that bird heat. We're, we're, we always are talking about bird heat. How much bird heat? Bird heat will heat a, a poultry house. A, a house full of birds on a cool day will warm that air in that house. Uh, the other type of heat, heat method of heat removal from the internal part of the bird is respiration or uh, latent heat removal. And that's the, that's the heat that's given by um, the evaporation of water in the lungs. It's actually like an evaporative panel in the lungs. And the, as the bird respires, he breathes, he is given off about seven BTUs per pound. And, and a bird has to continue to give five BTUs off the surface of his skin and seven BTUs uh, uh, through latent heat, or he will uh, begin to increase his deep body temperature. And so that, that's, that's kind of what we want to concentrate on. We've got to maintain heat balance of the bird. Now, one of the things that come along with tunnel, tunnel ventilation is that 
these num these numbers are uh, based on still air. Based on still air, and one of the things we are uh, we can do with a uh, with tunnel ventilation is we can shift the percentages of these heat losses. Uh, we can shift the amount of sensible heat and the amount of latent heat to keep the bird going uh, from going into heat stress. And I've got a we'll have a slide or two to look at that. But here we look at the, we, here we're looking at a couple of thermal images or a thermal image of some birds, and you can see the hot places in the bird. Uh, the, the the of course the the orange is where the hottest place in the bird is, and and uh, and the uh, uh, the blue is the is the cooler. So if you if you take a house with with approximately uh, twenty thousand uh, two point two kilo birds or or uh, uh, 22,000 five pound birds. It's the equivalent that the amount of latent heat given off is, is could approach a million BTUs per hour. And so there's a tremendous amount of heat being given off by birds and it's given off in the winter, it's given off in the summer, it's based on this biological uh, fuel that the birds are, that the birds are uh, uh, eating to feed. So this, this is just a, a simple de depiction of birds are air cooled and the birds are respiratory cooled. Uh, 11, 5 BTUs per pound, 11 BTUs per kilogram, or 15.4 BTUs per kilogram. And so those are the two, dyna two dynamics of heat transfer. Well, the, when you start talking about poultry housing, depending on where you are in the world, the first thing that comes into mind is climate. Where, when you design a poultry building, it, the first thing I would ask is, tell me about the climate. Tell me where it's located. Tell me what your worst your worst case scenario temperatures are in the winter. What are your worst case scenarios in the summer? And what about humidity? Are you in a high desert? Or are you in a uh, Are you on the seaside? So. These things affect uh, stocking density and they also affect the type of house that you build. So I know we have hundreds of people on this webinar today from a lot of different places in the world. So, and, and we can't change the houses that we already have. So we need to look at the tools that we have in our houses. And, and one of the, one of the, the most uh, important uh, tools that we have for managing heat stress during the warm time of year is what is our stocking rate? What is our uh, birds per square foot or birds per square meter? What is our stocking rate? Because as we place more pounds of bird, more birds in the house and thus have more pounds of, of meat in the house during the end of the grow out, we're going to have a maximum amount of heat put into the building and it's going to be part of the uh, ventilation system to take that heat out of the building. And we can remove heat from the building, but if the stocking density is so high that the birds are so close together, even, even taking the heat out of the building won't take the heat out of the bird. So there is a difference in taking the heat out of the bird and taking the heat out of the building. Now, ventilation uh, is, is good for air changing buildings. We've always talked about ventilation with respect to how, how many air changes do we get. And generally when we're talking about air changes per building, we're, we're talking about removing the heat from the building. In tunnel ventilation, we're also talking about velocity. We're talking about wind speed. The, the accelerated movement of air over the bird in meters per second or feet per minute. So in, in, in the ventilation aspect, we know that the wind chill effect or the accelerated heat removal will, will, will allow us to shift the, the way that, that birds lose their heat. Also, another thing we want to uh, uh, min, uh, talk about just a moment today is evaporative cooling systems. They're, they're used to cool the incoming air. They actually add humidity to the air and, and so we have to be careful when we use them, how they use them. And as I mentioned earlier, we, we do need to manage what we have. We can't change our existing poultry houses. There may be times of the year that we have to struggle through a tough time of year. 
This is a, a, a graphic that I think is good to follow. I, I would hope all poultry men, po poultry women, professionals would have an understanding of this graphic because I think it's, to me, it was one of the, the most profound um, concepts and truths that I came across in my long career doing poultry. And if we would take a quick look at this visual, you'd see that you know, the, there's no temperature given here. There's no, there's no um, specific temperature given. And you see we're in the, on the temperature axis and here we're at a very warm, hot temperature and here we're at a very cold temperature. And we're going to take a look at a bird and we're gonna look at two factors. We're gonna look at if we put that bird in a perfect condition, which is this optimum performance zone, we'll see that this is the energy in kilocalories that the bird will, in, will take from uh, the feed. And this is the maintenance energy that is required to run his body, to pump his blood for, uh, 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 for, for respiration. And though so the, the nutritionists have designed their rations on, on, on being in the thermal comfort zone. The bird is not at heat stress, and so there are calories left over for growing and gaining. That's the, that's the concept of, uh, of, um, of the modern broiler production. We want to get the maximum efficiency from feed. As we move colder in energy, uh, the bird eats a little more. We always know that in cooler times, birds take in a little more energy. They, they, eat, they eat more, but, and the reason they're doing it is, is to increase their caloric production and heat their body. So as they take in more energy and they're using some, some of this, um, and they're using some of this uh, kilocalories uh, for heating, their, their body maintenance energy requirements. So you have a little less room for growing and gaining. So you see as you run the house cooler, your efficiency gets a little bit less. Now let's move it, let's move the, the, the uh, performance zone into the other direction. And what you'll see here is that in the other direction, it changes much quick, much more quickly. The line uh, is a much steeper curve and it doesn't take much of movement uh, towards warmer that we are to the point where we're not growing or gaining anymore. We are now not growing or gaining. As we move this way, the bird is saying, hey, I've got to do something. I've got to increase the, the rate of, of uh, heat leaving my body and therefore I, my uh, maintenance requirements are going up and my energy income is going down. And now we're in this area, we're in a deficit. We're actually going backwards. And we're, and these birds are in a hot condition. So one, another piece of work that we should all be familiar with is the work that was done at uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture by Dr. Simmons and Barry Lott uh, many years ago. This is this is still a classical work, but if you're if you're looking at birds basically in still air, roughly in still still air, about 70% of the heat that the birds lose comes from respiration, and about 30% of the heat that the birds lose to the air. Uh, it, it's direct convective heat loss. So just keep this in mind. And we have a bird now that we're, as we looked at the previous slide, we have a bird now that we're pushing in because of environmental conditions, he's being pushed into a warm situation. So he begins to start thinking about panting or his body reaction is to pant. Well, that means he's going to be less efficient. This, this graph looks at at wind speed for a 2.2 kilo bird at 30 degrees C. It's a five, a five pound bird at 86. So what is the correct temperature? Uh, it, it, we're in still air, the bird is comfortable. And as, the, as that bird is warmed up, he, he's, his body is going to uh, increase, uh, is going to increase the amount of panning. If we begin to put velocity across the bird, we can reduce his panting. We we're going to reduce the panting percentage because of air velocity, one meter per second, two meter per second. And 
and, and these numbers are, are, are for more for example than they are exact, but at three meters per second, you see a bird that was in 70% uh, uh, respiratory heat loss is now at 50%, uh, is at 50% respiratory heat loss. And, and the convective or windshield heat loss across the surface of his skin has increased. So the, the, the third dimension or the fourth dimension, if you want to look at it for tunnel ventilation is by adding wind speed, we increase the, the heat removal off the surface of the skin of the bird. And thus we, he feels as if he is in his comfort zone, the temperature does not matter. Birds can be comfortable at more than one temperature, but they have, you have to specify temperature. You also have to specify airspeed over the bird. You may want to also specify humidity, but we, we can't control humidity. We can monitor humidity. We have some control over humidity, but our main uh, ability to control or to, uh, to affect heat stress in uh, warm weather broiler uh, production is through the amount of air velocity that we put across the bird. So another factor to think about is, uh, uh, is the mass of the bird. And often, uh, even myself, we talk about birds who, um, depending, depending on their age, well, it's really not age. This is, this is a graphic of wind chill effects for a four week old and a seven week old bird. Well, let's say the seven, the seven week old bird at, at 30, it's just 32 degree air, 90 degree Fahrenheit air. And if we look at, if we look at a, a, a bird that is a mature bird, a seven week old bird with two and a half meters per second, we can get a wind chill effect of about 10 degrees or three, uh, five degrees <coughs> uh, Celsius. So a large bird, a b large mass bird, a mature bird with two and a half meters per second, uh, 500 feet per minute, we, we get a wind chill effect of, of five, to t five Celsius to 10 Fahrenheit. But should that bird be a four week old bird, maybe a one kilo bird, whatever your body weights are, you can see that the effect of the wind chill on that bird is much greater. So if we have a house that is running in full tunnel ventilation on four week old birds or, or smaller one kilo birds, we may actually put more wind speed on those birds than they need. And we actually might shift the heat transfer away from the birds in a manner more than we need. So it's important to be, to be sure that, that we understand the effect of wind speed. We, when tunnel ventilation first came about, uh, many people would call, uh, especially new adopters of tunnel ventilation, say, we don't like tunnel ventilation. It, it, we cannot uh, uh, duplicate the US results on tunnel ventilation. We, our birds stay down and we, we found out that, that they went to tunnel ventilation way too soon and uh, they went to tunnel ventilation too soon. They put the birds on the, on the litter, on the floor. The birds didn't want to get up. They were basically, um, they were basically trying to get out of the wind. So, so the, the size of the bird, actually it's the mass of the bird, has a tremendous amount to do with, uh, with the, the ability to pull heat off the bird. And I, I like to call that accelerated, accelerated heat removal. So the question sometimes I ask, and, and we should always ask this, winter or summer, what is the correct temperature for a five pound or 2.2 kilo bird? Well, at, 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 90, at, at 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 centigrade, and with two and a half meters per second, this bird is comfortable. Uh, this same bird would, might be comfortable at 26 degrees, and, um, uh, and, and no wind velocity. So we, we have to be careful of, uh, as far as understanding what temperature curves are and, 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 uh, uh, and how they affect, uh, it's really about heat removal from the birds than it is strictly about temperature. This work was done at the University of Georgia a few years ago. Uh, I believe it was done by a grad student. Uh, I think it's an excellent piece of work and basically what uh, these, uh, what this work says that if we take, if we took some birds 
at at about a, that are and heat stress them up to a I don't have Celsius on this, but up up to a a, a temperature over a period of hours. So we're going to look at um, we're going to look at at a bird that's in its thermal comfort zone, and we're going to heat stress that bird until the deep body temperature uh, goes up to about 109 degrees. And then we're going to put a half of a meter per second on the bird. And uh, the, the most important thing to see here is we begin to take the uh, deep body temperature back down as we put air velocity on this, on this uh, five pound bird, this 2.2 kilo bird, you will begin to see that the, the deep body temperature begins to come down, but it takes three hours for the temperature to come down. So this is an indication that a, lar a large bird, once, once it has been heat stressed, this large bird has this energy in store, stored in them. So the, the body of the bird becomes a heat sink. So now let's look at a different type of, um, uh, let's look at a, a different type of air velocity where, where, we're coming, where we're coming up and we're going to heat stress at 43 degrees. Uh, and, and we see that with, with two meters per second, I see there's an error in this slide. Maybe it got changed. Maybe it got changed during our preparation. But here in this slide, we're, look, we're looking at a two meter per second air velocity. And notice how much more rapidly the deep body of the, te of the temperature of the bird changes. So th this, is, this, this should tell us that the, just about the most important thing that we can have for hot weather ventilation in tunnel ventilated houses is get air velocity across the bottom, across the body of the bird. Very important concept to, to, get, to get across. So you can see uh, the rectal temperatures going from, from, um, uh, 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 from a high of 43 down to 42.3, down to 42. And th this is what happens when the deep body, of the, the deep body temperature of the bird is, is high. Uh, I think the deep body temperature of most mature broilers is about 104 degrees. So these birds in this, uh, in this photograph right, right here are, are definitely heat stressed. So what are, some of, what, are, what are some of the practical tips or some things that we as broiler uh, managers, growers uh, might do to um, uh, to remove heat stress, first, we may not be able to prevent it, but uh, one of the things we need to do as, as, the, as, the, as we go through the day and we begin to see birds beginning to show some uh, panting, uh, we need to get more air on the birds. Generally speaking, air velocity is the first tool. Don't wait uh, uh, until you see um, all of the birds in a house panting. Get more air on the birds. And uh, we have a, a management tip that we use in the U.S. It's like when you have more than about 5% of your birds panting, that tells you that the bulk of your flock is about where they want to be. But if more than 5% of the birds are panting, that's your indicator. Uh, because the birds can't tell us and we don't always know exactly. We can be looking at temperatures on a temperature curve, but the real, the real thing to tell us about comfort of birds and thermal efficiency of birds and feed efficiency of birds is how are we looking at the flock? So uh, after, if birds, if, if, we, if we go through a day and because of the house, the insulation of the house, the weather, we're, we're not able to, keep the bird at, uh, in, in, a, in a comfort zone. We've got to take that heat out of the bird as we go into the nighttime hours. As nighttime approaches, generally we get, a, we get 10, 8, 10 degrees Celsius, 20 degrees Fahrenheit change in, 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 in ambient air temperature, outside ambient air. So immediately uh, a lot of our controllers or our thermostats will turn off some of the ventilation fans because we're programmed on air temperature. And we've got to remember, even though some of the fans are, are cutting off, we've got to, again, look at that bird and say, hey, our air temperature in this house may be okay, but is there still heat 
inside the mass of the bird, do we need to um, do we need to continue to pull heat out of the body of the bird as we go into the nighttime hours? So it's always a good idea to to, to continue to run fans into the night and get pull the heat out of the body of the bird. On the, another tip that from a management standpoint, and I think this is a we all need to try to remember this is that what is the what's the purpose of uniformity in a broiler house? So the importance of uniform density cannot be overstated. We, we there's been study after study after study. I, I don't need to go into it that when we put a, a higher velocities of air, when we turn the poultry house into a wind tunnel, when the air is coming in at one end of the house, going out at the other end of the house, the uh, the, the birds will migrate toward the colder air. We actually have a, a two or three degrees Celsius difference in temperature from one end of the house to the other, five degrees Fahrenheit from one end of the house to the other. The, the inlet end of the house is generally cooler uh, than the exhaust end of the house. Birds tend to migrate and they're gonna migrate. So when birds migrate, their density changes and in addition to their density changing, the heat buildup is different, uh, ambient release is different in the front of the house and the back of the house. And another thing that happens when we have migrated birds is the, the birds per pan, the, the, the feeder space density changes. So this is very important that migration fencing should not restrict the airflow and that migration fencing should be put in very early in the grow out because, uh, and, and I like migration fencing in the winter because we're trying to maintain, we're always trying to maintain litter quality, moisture, uh, uniform, keeping bird uniformity is very important. I can show a lot of pictures of different type of fencing, but we, we need migra migration fencing that uh, allows air to pass. Uh, uh, solid fencing is not a good idea. Um, it, and uh, uh, so migration fences is there, are there for two reasons. One is uh, to, to maintain uniformity for help, helping in uh, heat removal, but also to maintain bird or, bird uh, feed, feed per pan uniformity as well. Uh, many shifting on to uh, your house should be se tightly sealed. In, in the U.S. many years as ago as we, as we changed from um, retrofitted from um, conventional type houses to tunnel ventilated houses, we found out that the houses were not uh, extremely tight. And, and in building a, a new a new tunnel ventilated house, we need to have it very tight, no air leaks in the house. The perimeter, when we're in tunnel ventilation, the perimeter air inlets, any openings into the attic should be closed off. The house needs to be sealed. Uh, we want this house to be, uh, we want this house to be a, um, a closed tunnel uh, and sealed. So all over the world, there are many different types of uh, broiler houses and and we, if we take a thermal camera, we can see here the evaporative panels here where air is, cold air is coming in, but we also see uh, 38 degrees Celsius uh, uh, at, at over 100 degree air leaking in the ceiling of this house and in the house on the right side, we see air leaking in the house. And these, these air leaks are, are nothing more than short circuits, uh, short circuits of our evaporative panels. And, and we need to try to build new houses and, and condition old houses to, to make this completely go away. We want to stop air, air leaking if we possibly can. Um, the next tip would be to look at our evaporative cooling system and, and to really to eliminate airflow restrictions. And um, in the US, we, we, we want to be sure in all places uh, that are using evaporative panels or pads we want to make sure we have enough pads. Uh, early, early on in design of broiler housing, we, we did not necessarily put a, uh, enough pads. Uh, when you have fan capacity in uh, cubic meters per hour, there is a, uh, a square meter formula to use to come up with the exact amount of pad necessary. It's probably better to have more pad than not enough pad, but. Uh, certainly, there. Uh, if you were to add uh, an extractor or fan to a broiler house, you should always add 
pad to go with it. We use plenum rooms a lot in the U.S. Uh, and um, so uh, we, we, we like to make sure that the plenum rooms are, are configured properly. We could have plenty of pad and then, then our windows into the house where our tunnel door is, our tunnel curtain is, or they might be incorrect. So you want to think about a smooth transition of air from the outside through the evaporative panel into the window of the house. You want to think about the interior of the house. You don't need a, a brood curtings, air deflectors, hanging curtains, fences. And of course, this is uh, another reason why, uh, why migration fences need to be um, uh, non-restrictive. So here, here are a couple inlets, a lot of different tunnel inlets I've seen over the world. And so we say, well, we have uh, two and a half meters or, or, or six feet here, but we have a restriction. The curtain is not all the way down. Here we have a, a, a large tunnel inlet, but because of the way the doors are configured, we, we have restrictions. So there, there are restrictions and we don't have time to go into it, but it's important not to restrict the air because when we restrict the air, we increase the static pressure and we make the fan, the, the key here is the more restrictions, the less airflow because of the fan's ability to operate at higher pressures. So, um, the, the cool, the evaporative system should be clean. The water should be clean, no dirty spots, no streaks. I think I've got a couple, and this is a typical uh, dry spots on the pad. Here we have the header, the headers of the pad, uh, above the pad that release water. Some of them are stopped up. Uh, in the U.S., we don't do as good a job as we possibly could, um, uh, ensuring that we have enough water. Here, here you see a, an evaporative system where perhaps this is the hottest day of the year. And you can see here that we're doing a good job of evaporating water at the top of the, up the top of the evaporative panel, but the pads are dry below. So what does this mean? It means that it means that we might not be supplying enough water to this pad. You can't see this very well without a thermal camera, but th this is dry and this is hot air coming into the house. This is conditioned air. This is, this is 83 degree Fahrenheit air and this, in air, uh, this uh, this is uh, I'm sorry. This is 74 degree Fahrenheit air here, and this is 83 to 85 degree Fahrenheit air. It's because of the it's because of the um, the amount of water. We could be water restricted to our pads. So here here are some of the things we've seen in evaporative cooling system troughs, panels, sumps. I want you all to be aware of of the dirt that can get into these or the broiler houses are in, in, in dirty, dusty conditions. So you see that sometimes that we need to, uh, to completely flush the system and you'll see that we have a, uh, a lot of dirt sometimes. I need to move on and um, uh, the, the quickly talk about fans. It's the heart of the body. It's just like a human. We don't live without our heart. We want to take care of our hearts. And it goes without saying that everything with respect to fans, belts tight are, are, are of course, one of the most important things. Uh, we can't change the number of fans. Looking at the pulleys, uh, looking at the shutters, a dirty, a dirty fan shutter can cut airflow by 30%. It's the air velocity that we're after. You, know, you see these dirty shutters not opening properly uh, and that's restricting airflow. But loose belts, here we see very loose belts, uh, slippage. Um, uh, yes, the blades are turning, but are, are we getting the cubic feet uh, CFM or cubic meters per hour output by the fans? This is, critic this is critically important. You cannot, human, a human can't live without the heart beating. A hot weather poultry house cannot live without adequate airflow. So here we see a, 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 a worn fan belt sitting in the bottom of the pulley. Here we see a, 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 the proper seating of the belt in the, in the pulley and uh, just can't overemphasize. This changes the gear ratio, changes the CFMs of the air, or, and so it's, we can have as much as a 25% reduction in airflow uh, by just, uh, so well, it's not a broken belt, 
but it's a worn belt. So uh, the tensioners need to be in place. Everything needs to be lubed up. Everything needs to be uh, in, in good shape. And as we finish up here, let's, let's look at one or two more very uh, in, important uh, uh, visuals. One is the windshield curve. This is a theoretical windshield curve. If we want to get maximum wind chill, we need six in the neighborhood of 600 feet per minute or three meters per second. We have five at, at two, at a, at a, um, at um, a, about 250 feet per minute or even uh, 300 feet per minute, we get about five degrees of wind chill. At 500 feet per minute wind speed, two and a half meters per second, we're gonna get 10 degrees theoretical wind chill. If we have 600 feet a minute, we're gonna get 15 degrees or, th or about, about seven or eight degrees Celsius of wind chill. The important thing to look at here is this last 100 feet per minute or this last 0.5 meters per second is the most valuable in removing heat from the bird. And so what it tells me is air, air velocity, the number of fans, the maintenance of the fans, they're if you have only one thing you can work on, work on airflow, it is absolutely critical. Um, let's, let's, uh, let's look at the, 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 this, I've talked about most of these, but the most important tool for increasing heat removal from the bird is additional, additional wind speed, additional wind speed. The, the last item, uh, the last item or two I'll mention has to do with your backup system, your electrical system. Uh, we all know that if we lose, it, most our houses in the U.S. do not have the ability to open the house. If we lose power, we're in big problems. Our electrical system, our generator is the lifeblood. All poultry farms in the U.S., 99% uh, have standby electric generators. And we did a survey of over 20 complexes last year, and we found that uh, in, in those com complexes, 43% of the losses, catastrophic losses, was due to generator failure. Most other losses were preventable. They were human error. So we can't say enough about generator maintenance. It's, presentation after presentation has been given on this. But as we go into the hot weather time of the year, we need to keep all of these facts um, uh, in mind. Can your, can your, uh, can your, uh, uh, your, your generator system uh, uh, transfer automatically? Uh, do your people know how to do this? Because a lot of times we can get the generator to run, but we can't get the transfer to transfer over. So these are all tips for avoiding catastrophic heat loss. So air velocity and airflow are the, are the big tools. Heat transfers tells us that, you know, if we have, we're gonna get more heat transfer if we have a higher difference in temperature from, outside, uh, from ambient air to the bird. Uh, uh, there is, we've already talked about the time delay necessary to pull this residual heat out of the bird. I don't know of any. I don't know of any real de detrimental effects as to too air of a, too much air velocity. As I mentioned earlier, if, if five percent of your birds are panting, I would say you, your your goal should be to add more air velocity. The the worst case scenario in broiler housing in the U.S. or anywhere in the world is have a high humidity and insufficient air velocity. So. Uh, with, it, with that being said, uh, I'm going to uh, uh, turn the floor back over to uh, Miguel and uh, we can move forward with the uh, questions and answer time. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, now we can move on to the Q&A session. So if you have any questions, you can type them in the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen. Yep. 
I see several, I see several questions uh, on the panel that have come up and I will attempt to uh, answer. The first question is, uh, can, can you explain what is wind chill effect? And I, I, I'm not going to type the answer. I'm going to answer that live. Wind chill effect is what I would call accelerated heat removal. It's no different uh, than when you ride a bicycle or a motorcycle. You see in the U.S. we talk about this. I use it at our meetings. Uh, uh, guys who ride motor scooters or motorbikes, even though the temperature is very uh, pleasant, a lot of times they're going to put on um, a jacket. Uh, the, the, the big motorcycle riders, they, they're going to put on a leather jacket. And the reason they, they do that is because they, the air velocity is uh, sucking the heat out of their body. So that, that's all wind chill effect is. By, by rapidly moving air, lots of air across a, a body, we're pulling the energy out of the body. So, um, and that on, on one of the slides that we looked at, uh, we, we saw that the wind chill effect for a chick, a baby chick, could be disastrous in comparison to the wind chill effect for a mature bird. We would never think about full tunnel ventilation on day old birds. That would be uh, a mistake. So uh, I hope that's explained it. Uh, it you know, it's, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's not complicated, but it is, there are a lot of moving parts in heat transfer and there are a lot of moving parts in wind chill effect uh, uh, I would encourage you to, to uh, look at some of the publications that have been done and, and maybe study the graph. So uh, with that, I'm going to end that question. Does, do, do, do side fans, there's another question that I will answer live, do side fans help or decrease airspeed in the house? Well, to have the best tunnel effect, we would really like to have all of the fans at one end of the house and the air inlet at the other house. Uh, side fans help change the air in the house, but they don't, they don't uniformly increase air velocity down the house. Side fans are more or, or less for cooler operation, if, especially if, they're, if we have a 120 meter long house, a 500 foot long poultry house, four or five side fans down the house would be uh, more for milder weather, cooler weather. Uh, we, should have, we should have at least, at least one air change per minute uh, tunnel, tunnel fan capacity on a house. We really don't need to think about air changes and air change capacity. What we should be thinking about is how, what is the design velocity or um, meters per second depending on the bird size, what size bird am I uh, growing in kilos or pounds, and, uh, and density. So uh, some, some broiler houses would be fine at two and a half meters per second. Some would be at 500 feet per minute. Some would need uh, maybe uh, 3.5 meters per second. Depends, it depends. There's not a correct answer for that. It depends on your, your, your climate. So that, uh, 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 that will end. That will end that uh, the question. Um, and here, here I have one more question uh, that I will try to answer live. Uh, the I was talking about wind chill effect for four week old birds, and um, uh, uh, the, I think the question basically had to do with. If, if I have a wind chill effect for a four week old bird, if I increase the air velocity on that bird, uh, will that increase the wind chill effect? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, th th there, there is a, uh, there, there, if there is a delta T as we increase air velocity, wind chill effect will increase. Uh, that's a fact uh, in, in, uh, when tunnel ventilation first came about, and we would uh, have um, we would have uh, air, ambient air temperatures coming into the house at 90. That's 90 Fahrenheit. I think that's about 32.2 uh, Celsius. We found out that if you're if you're wind chilling birds 
with 90 degree Fahrenheit air at about 32 degrees centigrade, you're not doing much to help them because that, that air temperature is so high that you're not pulling a, a tremendous amount of heat from the body of the bird. The, the, the purpose of the, uh, the purpose of the, um, of the evaporative cooling panel is, to re is not to cool the birds, it's to cool the air. So if we have air coming into a, a broiler house at 33, 34 degrees centigrade, 100 degrees Fahrenheit, then we can take this air with the evaporative panel and reduce the, the temperature of the air to 30 degrees C or 86 degrees Fahrenheit. Now we have air that can, that has a, tr a, a bigger difference in temperature between the bird and the air temperature. And by decreasing the air temperature, we're able to pull more air, uh, pull more heat out of the bird. So, so, um, I, I, the, in summary, yes, the answer to that question is more in general, more air velocity will increase the wind chill effect. The definition in my uh, perspective of wind chill effect is accelerating the release of heat from the surface of the bird skin. So with that, I will end, I will end that question. Jim, um, let me take two of them. Um, there is a couple of questions on um, uh, on feed strategies. Um, so I would like to take these. What kind of feed strategies we have to follow in summer <clears throat> time? I think from a nutritional perspective, it is interesting to look at the time of feeding. So uh, when um, to avoid a feeding at the hottest time of the day, and also to look at your feed formulation because the heat increment from um, from fat is um, uh, per kilo per per kilocalorie of energy is uh, is less than for carbohydrates and, and protein. So uh, you might go for a higher relative fat inclusion there as well. And um, uh, definitely the pellet, uh, the feed form, and a good size pellet will also reduce the cost and thereby um, energy. Um, uh, heat production that is that the birds has to uh, create to actually ingest the the feed so that that can be two things additionally there uh, electrolytes there was a question on that as well it's also nutritional the bird will lose some um, uh, minerals uh, during a heat stress situation so supplementation of electrolytes and all, uh, which can be either partly done through nutrition think about b Bicarbonate, yeah, uh, carbonate as a, as a as an um, as a good uh, choice in the feed, but also electrolytes in the drinking water in the acute phases of heat stress. Those are the more general uh, recommendation when it comes to um, to uh, feed strategies, and you can go into more detail looking at uh, antioxidant uh, components uh, certainly. So. Um we, we have another question here that has to do with evaporative panels, and uh, I will answer that question live. Yes, there, 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 are, there are tables. The question is, are there tables regarding the size of, of pads or evaporative panels uh, that are necessary in relation to the, uh, to the air? So if, if my memory serves me correct, we need approximately 60 square feet of six inch, um, I think that's 15 centimeters uh, of evaporative cooling pad. We need, we need a, 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 a approximately 60 square feet per, um, per, thousand, per, per, per 20,000 CFM of air. They're, they're, these tables exist, yes, they exist. They're not, they have been published. Uh, they're in a lot of places. Um, I didn't feel that it was, we're not designing a house today. And one of the, the but when, when you, the amount of pad you should put or amount of evaporative panel that you should put on a house is based on the, the, the CFM of the fans, the cubic meters per hour of the fans. You, people would call me up and say, Professor Jim, 
how much I have a five uh, 120 foot 120 meter house 500 feet long how much pad should I put on that house I can't answer that I have to know what the airflow is and so the, the or we'll get the same questions uh, I have a 120 meter house 500 feet feet long what uh, how many fans should I put on the house I don't know the answer to that can't do that that so when your houses are built the cross section determines the the amount of will help determine the amount of fan power that needs to be put at the exhaust end of the house and then from that you can calculate easily calculate the amount of pad if you don't have enough pad what happens you when you have a, a, a tunnel ventilated house it does not have enough evaporative cooling pad on it then the the fans have to work extremely hard to pull the the air through the pad. And when they do that, it makes them operate at high static pressure. That's, we call it static pressure. And uh, it can be in Pascals, it could be inches of water. Pascals, most Europeans talk in Pascals. So when the Pascals get too high, then the, the volume of air goes down. It's, it's based on the fan. So um, there are tables. I encourage you to look at the tables. Um, I, th I think that pretty much. Um, uh, I think that pretty much uh, uh, handles that question. Uh, another one that I'll answer live is how often should I test my generator under full load? The generator is how, how, we in the U.S. we test our generators weekly. They are they come on a regular time clock. They are tested weekly. A lot of times we don't put them under full load, which I think is a mistake. But certainly, uh, in between flocks would be the time to do that. And uh, a lot of places in the world, they don't have automatic switchovers. So we need to be careful that all of our managers, everyone knows exactly how to make that transfer. Because you don't transfer to full load with everything connected. In the US, we transfer to, we. We, we take the load off the generator, we change the gen in, into the generator mode, and then we begin to bring the broiler houses back. So it's, an important, it's a very important concept. And so with that being said, I will uh, see if we have another nutrition or water-based uh, question um, that we might want to take a look at uh, uh, while I scan through another one or two of these. Okay, I, I see another question. I, I can. What are the purpose of the temperature curves during the during the grow out? I'll, I'll answer that. And uh, um, temperature curves are are. Remember, uh, as I mentioned, temperature curves are there to tell us. Like on day one, we should be at 34 or 32 degree ambient air temperature, uh, not 90 degrees Fahrenheit. It, but by day 28, we 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 might need to be at 22 degrees. Uh, Celsius or 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And we have this progression that we would go down to, to uh, maintain optimum comfort zones for the bird. But those are, those, are based on, those are based on still air. So the temperature curves that are provided by the broiler breeder companies are based on still air. They're a guide. They work very well in cold weather. They don't work very well in uh, in, in, in warmer weather and so we have to factor in the ambient air temperature minus the wind chill effect and because it's not precise we have to monitor the birds if every bird is on the ground and none of them are on the feeders you've got too much air velocity on the birds if a, a small percentage of the birds are panting and the birds are eating and drinking you're, you're probably very close to the comfort zone so with that being said, I, um, uh, I'll, I'll conclude that question. All right, we're due to end this webinar very soon. We'll try to stick around for a few minutes and give participants a chance to have their questions answered. Um, I'm not sure if we're still broadcasting, but I would say thank you to uh, EW Nutrition for the opportunity to share today. 
and uh, we look forward to looking, uh, we look forward to some of the questions that might be sent in. Thank you very much, Professor Jim. Uh, there are still questions unanswered in the Q&A box, and I apologize for not being able to deal with all of them during this session. However, we will be more than happy to pick up our conversation via email. If you write to webinar at ew-nutrition.com, all questions will be routed to us. Also, this webinar will be made available on our website tomorrow. You can also join us in our next sessions, which you can find online. Don't forget our questionnaire is coming right up. Uh, thank you for attending and your questions. Stay safe and bye for now.